How's it, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Exponential Conversations, where we are bringing you the best thought leadership, innovation, and technology from South Africa and around the world. And today we are fortunate to have in the studio with us Adam Pantanovitz, who's a fanatical technologist. He enjoys solving seemingly unsolvable problems, particularly with the help of cloud computing and machine learning. He's part of the Singularity South Africa and global faculty with a focus on biotechnology and speaks about the future of technology with a focus on tech human convergence. He's also no stranger to lecturing and has been passing the baton in the faculties of engineering and medicine at the University of Witz, Johannesburg since 2009. He's busy doing his PhD uh, in artificial intelligence. Uh, he studied biomedical and electrical engineering and has had some amazing innovations that res have resulted in a number of patents, academic papers and creations. He's uh, created the Brainternet. We're going to chat about that in a bit. Also, he's a fellow at the IET, the Institution of Engineering and Technology, charted inter internationally as an engineer, co-founded many businesses such as Aura, Terrific, Labuntu, among others, and acted as a CTO of an indirect tax fintech business. So with that, let me welcome onto the show, Adam Pantanovitz. Thank you very much, Mick. Great to see you. Great to see you. And uh, great to see that you're enjoying some nice, lovely weather out there in uh, Johannesburg. Wuhanesburg. Absolutely. Is cool. Yeah, I'm, I'm very sad to say that there's this terrible COVID situation happening at the moment, but it is a very beautiful day. And I think the weather is ironically not reflective of that climate. Awesome. And um, I think let's just jump right into it. I want to do today's episode is called Hacking Humans. And it's really going to be focusing around, you know, the, the, the things that you're passionate about and what you have been involved in. And I mean, you've been just hearing from your bio and, and knowing you, you know, you've been involved in this whole concept of how to embrace hacking our own bodies and 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 evolving ourselves as as humans but like what let's go back to the beginning why what made you want to get into this field or why why choose something like this i think that's a really great question and i i, I would have to go back to a medical incident that that occurred in my life when i was a lot younger when i was around 13 14 years old i had due to a neuropathic condition or a neuropathy I had to have some surgeries and the surgeries were extremely challenging. They went wrong and all sorts of things went wrong during that process, which actually caused a big cascade in my life and ultimately resulted in my being able to get into biomedical engineering at Wits University. So there was this weird turn of fate that resulted in my getting into biomedical engineering. It wasn't exactly architected by myself because at the time I missed a great deal of school. I didn't really know where I wanted to take my career. My life was kind of in a state of real flux and disaster management. But having gotten into the field, I immediately recognized a huge resonance with it. I realized I could use the opportunity to try to make life better for others. Um, I have a great passion for medicine, for an understanding of how the human body works. And I have this great passion for engineering. And this really fused these two worlds together. And going through a very difficult time when I was younger really led to this opportunity and then really inspired me to try to take it and create with it. Amazing. So you, you were actually inspired by your own personal adversity. Absolutely. And how did, what did you do? What, what were some of the things that you did to overcome? Well, I was very much inspired by my own personal situation because I realized that like I was going through challenges, very many other people go through similar challenges that greatly impact their lives. Personally, some of the things that I did, um, I had multiple interventions that I implemented myself, which included taking high doses of certain vitamins and testing out how they would react with my own body. And I started to do psychological interventions like meditation and therapy and all sorts of different things which were really just a test on myself to try to create a better future for myself so in order to overcome my medical difficulty i needed to spend a lot of time really working on i suppose my internal world and then things started to ease in my external world if i can put it in, that, in those terms 
But I realized then that many people are going through all sorts of immense challenges that I can't even fathom. And how great would it be if we could use technology to greatly disrupt their trajectories, to change the way that they see their futures for, for enabling them for the better. And technology ju does just this. It's just bundled up and ready for us to utilize it as a tool to improve things. So I use tech in my own personal journey in a variety of ways. I used it for data analysis and measurement and daily inspiration and reminders. It really created a framework to keep me on track personally. But then I realized that through my interactions with tech, there are all sorts of interventions that we can use as humans that are cognitive. And then, of course, there are great interventions that are, that are more coupled with our own bodies that we can leverage to help other people be the best versions of themselves. So I think I love it. I mean, do you want to just keep elaborating on what are these types of interventions? Like you're, you were your own Victor Frankenstein, basically. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! Uh, working on yourself. <laughs> so, you know, yes. what, what would you do? Like, give us some, uh, what can others uh, sort of do to try to hack themselves? To okay, prove it's a is really it great question. Is it, yeah. Yeah. I think it really depends on what your objectives are, but there are a variety of interventions that we can all use to improve ourselves without using any kind of sophisticated tech. And then you would be really surprised when it comes to sophisticated tech, how easy and accessible that stuff actually is. So I'd like to give you some examples. We built a eye controlled wheelchair about 10 years ago. That was very simple. We took a normal wheelchair and we hacked it to, de to look at a little voltage that develops across the eye when you move the eye. And we measured that voltage and we were able to control the wheelchair to then move with eye movement. And this was done for less than $100 in a lab with two engineers, and it took about six weeks to do. So that's just an example of the types of things. But really, it's only bounded by the upper limits of our imagination. We can solve just about any problem using technology. It's just about which problems are most important to us, which we choose to solve. Another great example um, is, is recently at WITS, uh, some of the students have developed an amazing sign language interpretation device. It's another type of human computer interaction device that allows people who don't speak sign language to communicate with people who do speak sign language. So these are the types of applications that we're talking about. When it comes to managing your own personal life, I believe tech is a great enabler. I think it can help you get much better data on your life. And you know that old saying, you can't measure, you can't manage. You need to be able to take measurements and get data of your own life, where you are. You need to try to figure out what the causality is between events in your life and outcomes. And depending on what you're trying to optimize for, you can create optimization loops to try to really get through something. So I believe any challenge can be quite easily managed when you have the right toolkit, when you're able to get data, you're able to really make measurements and assess what outcome you're trying to, to create. I think it's fascinating. And, and, you know, just to think about how long did this take you? You know, when you were, when you were going through your own journey, what age were you and where, when did it, you over, overcome? When did you start seeing results? Did it, you know, was it months or was it years? How long did it take you to actually hack your own body before? And then, you know, at Singularity, we talk about, it's about a mindset. It's really about understanding what mindset you you trying to go for if it's a longevity mindset and then working towards those steps like are you still doing some of those things or you know so it's there's a it's quite a lot of very much, um, so. Very much um, so big question there it's, yeah yeah it's a big and great question because i'm i'm not i'm functionally much better than i've ever been but i'm not fundamentally yet healed though i do believe that technology will very soon bring about a cure to to my underlying condition i do better with it all the time but it is a continuous back and forth a continuous battle you know sometimes i chat to my wife about is it uh you, you know if i'm having a difficult day and I, I need to give for instance a talk about my condition or about where i am in life and i feel a little bit vulnerable in that moment to say is it okay for me to to do this because i'm still kind of going through it and, and uh, my wife often comforts me by reminding me that this is a continuous battle. This is 
part of the magic of it is that it's ongoing and it needs to be managed in an ongoing way. In truth, it took me many years to get to that point. It took a number of years because when I was struck with all of this, I was a young boy and I didn't have any of the tools or coping mechanisms. And it was really through, I suppose, a journey of exploration and then exploitation, figuring out like where to look and then figuring out how to hone in on something through which I was able to find out what levers I could use to help manage my own situation. It was highly exploratory. I didn't have any of the answers. And in the beginning, to be frank, I didn't have any of the will or the mindset or any of the tools on hand. And I needed to figure out how to build those over time. And that took a lot of time. And by the time I started to be able to do that, I'd had a lot of deterioration, to be honest, in my condition. In fact, you know, doctors had said to me that by the time I was 20, I would, well, first, when I was 13, I was told I would never walk again. But that didn't come true, thankfully. I was told by the time I was 20, I would be in a wheelchair. Absolutely, certainly, that didn't come true. In fact, by the time I was 30, I was supposed to have no functional use of my hands. Absolutely didn't come true. In fact, obliterated it. By the time I was 30, I was stronger than ever. And I was doing sort of one-armed pull-ups in the gym because I'd done so much self-work. And I was defying the medical framework in which I found myself. The doctors were, were starting to see me not as a patient, but more as a, an example, more as when I would go and see my neurologist, which I did more for enrichment instead of treatment at that point, he would say, this is an unbelievable case. You know, he, I was defying the odds. And that was what was amazing. It was this journey that allowed me to do that. But it took many years. It took a really a lot of effort. Many days it was very hard to get out of bed. As you can imagine, some days I just simply didn't. There were drugs involved. There were all sorts of challenges that, you know, without going into in great detail, we were able to thankfully overcome because of, uh, I think, mostly mindset. Amazing. Yeah, I, see, I don't think people realize how, you know, um, how challenging it must have been uh, when you, when, you know, when the doctors are telling you one thing like that and uh, you still have to you know, use your, the power of your positivity and your mind to get over it, you know, to defy the odds and you've done it. So, you know, it's, it's Thanks, pretty Nick. inspiring and pretty remarkable. Well, I'm very humbled and very grateful to hear that from you, to be honest. But I think one, one thing that triggers in my mind when you say that it was almost like because I was getting this information into my mind that I was going to be something and have to do something in a certain way, I almost became defiant. So it was... That's right. I didn't want to have this imposed on my life. I struggled. I mean, I emotionally accepted it. It took a long time to accept that it may be a potential outcome for my future. And I raged against it internally. Once I accepted it, I decided, all right, I can live with it, but I'm going to change it. I'm not going to necessarily have to live with it. And that was when I chose to create this framework for myself through measurements, data, self-enrichment, um, all these interventions that I tested. And try to figure out, you know, the very best way to live optimally um, for me. And everyone is individual. I believe everyone needs their own recipe. We all know what internal triggers we have. We all know how we interact with the external world best. We all have a sense of what foods and exercise and interventions work for ourselves. And each, each to their own. But I think we all need a framework in which to manage all of this. Yes. And, you know, I, I think it's so interesting because as a as a technologist and as a as a singularity faculty going around the world speaking to you know and sharing knowledge around hacking humans and how to you know change our biology and converge with the machines, just briefly, what are some of the benefits for humanity you know at large, and you know what are we seeing with all this these new advances in tech, exponential tech specifically? Well, Mick, I think that we are seeing probably the most exciting time for our species to ever have been alive. I mean, I think we are incredibly, incredibly lucky to be born at this time, to live at this time. The tech is completely astounding. I don't know where to begin in describing the potential for our species. Should we all choose to use it for the best possible purposes? We're seeing a time when people who were previously disabled are becoming fully enabled. We're seeing a time where long-standing genetic conditions that probably trace back hundreds of generations in our species are being obliterated. 
of course, we can't resent those genetics uh, because those are the very genetics that got us here in the first place, right? So through mutation, we, we arrived and uh, we can't resent the fact that we have, for instance, genetic diseases, but we now are at a time when we're able to eradicate those from our gene lines for all future generations of our species. Already these technologies exist and are easily accessible. In fact, Kim, our own Singularity U South Africa faculty member, my co-faculty Kim, has a company that does this very thing for people in South Africa. Scientists are learning to convert skin cells into stem cells. Even adults with no egg or sperm could conceivably become parents. For me personally, I work much more in the computing field. I use a lot of AI and machine learning in medical applications. And so my work is, is biomedical engineering, but approaching it from an electrical engineering perspective. So I use all the tooling from electrical engineering and try to apply it either to the body or to public health issues or to medical problems in radiology and medical imaging. Any type of problem like that, that involves cloud computing, AI, ML, that's really where I like to play. And I really like prototypes that bring together the physical human body with computing, with the internet, with the networks that exist nowadays. It's so fascinating. I think there's there's just so many opportunities to help humans be better and to augment our own physicality and our emotional well-being. Um, you know, like I've, I've been seeing that through um, through these these VR uh, uh, tactile sensors, you can actually create touch remotely. So you can give somebody with a disability that couldn't feel before now a new sense of feeling. And um, I know that you, you've been doing quite a lot of work with ShiftStream, which is, you know, looking at a lot of these amazing people that have had these adverse situations and 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 then sharing their stories. Do you want to share a little bit about what that is with us and some of the people that you've been chatting to? Thank you, Mick. I'd really love to. In fact, I, I'm very excited about and proud of ShiftStream. Um, I guess through that story that I told you through some of my own challenges that I briefly touched on earlier with you, I created this platform called ShiftStream where we're interviewing some truly remarkable people who I know went through their own immense challenges. And instead of being defeated by them, they were actually forged by them into greater versions of themselves. And so I look out, I, I seek out and I look for people who are out there in the world who have had astounding things happen in their lives and have created amazing successes of themselves in whatever form that takes ultimately. And people that I've had on there uh, for interviews are people like Tilly Lockie, Tilly from the UK, who I met at the SU summit in South Africa, which was an unbelievable experience. Tilly, who lost her arms at an extremely young age and now is not only a, the recipient of arms that allow her to be totally functional, but she is better. She is self-described as being better for having had this experience. Vivian Ming, another Singularity U faculty member who is totally astounding in her approach to disrupting many, many processes in the world through her research labs, which she gives away for free. Musa Mota, a local South African dancer, the most extraordinary and beautiful dancer you can imagine. Musa, Musa suffered from cancer and he lost his leg at a young age and he was a very, very keen soccer player. But he decided to redeploy his energy into dancing. So I interview these people to try and ask them questions about how they got to where they are against all odds. And in fact, I'm trying to draw the conclusion that they got there because of their challenges. They were forged and created to be better versions of themselves because of these things that happened to them. And so we never know what life can bring us if we are able to channel and move with whatever it is that we face with a positive attitude and open mind with a creation mindset that we can create a better future for ourselves by changing our own selves it it doesn't have to remain static the despair a person is in doesn't have to remain in despair every situation can be changed can be hacked every situation no matter how dire you feel it is you can uplift yourself from that situation and these people are great examples that they are doing it and that they have changed the world for the better because of it 
Love it. I think it's 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 so important uh, for everyone to hear, and uh, I, I think it's quite an interesting question you raise about you know was it because of their own adversity that made them want to overcome, or was it you know something inside them, or was it somebody who inspired them, one of their mentors or their teachers? Because you know a lot of people go through similar experiences and don't overcome, you know, and some people. Some people just seem to overcome because of their experience, but it, there must be other factors at play. You know, there must be the environment or, you know, it could be a, a teacher or a, a mentor figure or watching something online that inspired them to want to go out and, and do something or, or, you know, overcome their, their challenge. So I think it's Absolutely. an interesting question you raise actually around, you know, the intrinsics of motivation and, and desire to to want to improve yourself or to fix yourself? I mean, absolutely. I think we, in these cases, you're right. There is much more at play. And many people do struggle with adversity. And unfortunately, that, that adversity may sustain. It may not be obliterated in these same ways. And I think it's about equipping people with the tools and the knowledge that they can live a better life for themselves. They can create a better world for themselves. And I'm seeing that in each of the cases, there may or may not be this trend, but it seems that very often people have a very, very painful bottom moment. And they remember very clearly in their minds when that occurred and what that looked like. And it's almost that the pain of continuing in that moment, the pain of continuing in that very challenging, very difficult moment is worse than the pain that they know it will take to change their lives. They know that at that turning point, that point of inflection, their lives will be dramatically better forever because they never want to get back down to that minimum, that bottom, where it was so painful to stay that they were forced to face the pain of change because change is not easy. As we all know as human beings, it's very hard for us to accept change. And that's where tech comes in so nicely into this because tech creates rapid change. Our species is going through unprecedented rates of change. We speak about this at SU so often that we're going to experience more change in the future than we've experienced so far. And that's unfathomable to us because we've experienced so much great change in such a short space of time. And it's just, just booting up. It's just the dial-up modem right now. I can hear the sound in my, in my mind of that, you know, that 56K modem that is dialing up and connecting us up. Love it. I think, yeah, I mean, so, so much great uh, insight there around, um, you know, this, this, this change that we're facing and also the big decisions that these people had to make, that inflection point. I think, you know, we all had these decisions in our life and, you know, just by making the correct decision, it can have such a positive impact on your life or, you know, giving you that, that propel, that, uh, that, 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 that boomer to go and want to make something different. So I think it's Absolutely. really, really insightful. And um, and uh, like we're just at the change we've seen over the last two years. It's been phenomenal. Like if you, I'm expecting us to see, hear about aliens this year. I'm seriously think it will become a reality. We'll, you know, aliens will be discovered in 2021 or 22 because it's all sooner. Uh, who knows when, but it's coming because there's change is just happening. Radical things that we never thought were possible is happening. And uh and technology is enabling us to und to understand this change. Like we, you know, we technology will help us uh, find life sources, uh, you know, off planet. So it's, it's totally imaginable. I mean, we've got such vastness that we can't even fathom it in space. Imagine the vastness in time. I mean, we we haven't even begun to explore what's out there, right? And I mean, I read an article just I think it was just yesterday uh, that the nearest. One of the one of the planets near to I think it was Alpha Centauri, and I may stand corrected, but but it, it is this, yeah. capable of sustaining life. It has water apparently or allegedly, and it may have life. I mean, it's highly probable that there's life out there. Life seems to prevail under immense stress on this planet. Even in the deepest depth of the ocean, you see well suited, well suited adaptations. Through the evolutionary process, you have animals plants that have evolved to succeed despite all odds 
So there's something about life on this planet that just causes it to thrive. It's just an absolutely fascinating planet. But if you extrapolate that to all the time and space, you know, we just perhaps can't measure things yet. It's not implausible to think that absolutely there are aliens out there and hopefully we'll be able to measure them soon. And they're probably further along on, on the, the, the Fermi's paradox continuum. So they're hiding from us. So it's very hard to measure. We, we as humans are like, hey, everyone, we're here. Broadcast out to the world. But, uh, but the aliens probably being a bit smarter, if they exist, would be hiding away by default. <laughs> They are, yeah, that's what they probably, uh, Ray Kurzweil says, they may not have the technology to communicate with us yet. So maybe that's quite possible. we're all the more advanced beings, uh, is a that's, hypothesis I've heard from him before. It's a good hypothesis. It could be, it could be both. It could go either way on the continuum. But one would imagine that if you're very far along on the, the Fermi's paradox mm -hmm. continuum, you actually want to by default hide because it's probably not in your interests to you know, raise awareness about your own presence if you know that there are other species out there or other life forms in, in I mean, we can get into a whole philosophical fascinating debate about this. It's quite possible that there's lesser forms of life that perhaps haven't developed technology at all. So all of this is all of this is potentially plausible in all of that space and all of that time. And it's just about being able to observe it actually. Uh, I definitely don't exclude the possibility that that space aliens exist in some form <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Yeah. yeah i'm actually looking forward to it uh, you know uh, there's going to be a number of surprising changes that are going to happen in 2021 and it could be aliens could be one of them it's going to be a number of other factors coming our way so it's really we just need to be agile and adaptable for us personally you know we are postponing a big summit uh, because of the lockdown level four in South Africa and, and the recent COVID outbreak in, in our third wave. Has COVID affected you? And I know that you, you've you been studying a lot of the trajectory of COVID and, and the infections. Do you want to just comment a little bit about what you're seeing there and you know where you think it's going to go in the next uh, six months to a year? Absolutely, Mick. Uh, I think it's affected us all greatly, either through Potentially, we've had personal tragedy strike, strike as a result of COVID, or we've had just our lives being completely transformed and changed. So we've all been greatly impacted by it. I think that there are, in many respects, great negatives to this, and there are some positives to it. Depending on how we look at it, I think our adoption of digital technologies has increased. I think our ability to do more and reach more at scale and our ability to achieve more when we're thinking more carefully about our need to travel to do something and achieve something has been greatly changed. So there are some certain pros. There are certainly some pros. I mean, certainly on the ec ecological side, there have been some, some interesting recoveries this year and last year as a result of these lockdowns and as, as a result of the, the changes that we are having and making as a species. I have been affected in, in many ways, especially professionally. I, it is more difficult to do the type of work that we do where there is a big physical component, especially with, with people, when we're working with people. That's obviously disrupted. But then I've had a big boost in my productivity and some of the entrepreneurship stuff and some of the, the work that I do in uh, ML and AI. And that I've had really good focus time. So for me, there's, there's always certainly pros and cons in every situation. I think that you ask, where is this going to go? I think we all are wondering that. I've often said that the more biological airtime that we afford in terms of being hosts to this virus, the more biological airtime we give this virus, the harder it is for us to then cope with what, what comes afterwards. So we want to try and really do our best uh, to, to limit our exposure while the science catches up and then leverage the science as quickly as possible. Once we have consensus, once the prevailing view, the science guides us and leads us, then we wanna leverage that science and we can absolutely as a species overcome it. We're already seeing signs of that happening in many countries. Unfortunately, in South Africa, we're seeing a devastating wave right now. It's, it's, uh, not, it's not a good wave. I have seen signs of it slowing down, but I'd, I don't want to make that call too early. It's, but it's definitely right. decelerated we, have we from the data. Or... It's. I believe we peaked in terms of infections, but the problem is you don't want to call a local 
uh, maximum, right? It could it could absolutely, you know, continue to go up depending on all of the dynamics in the system. So it's hard to call. I think it's peaked. It's certainly decelerated, certainly decelerated. So I think it's peaked, but we will have to see how what the next few weeks bring us. It feels almost certain that we should be unbundling access to vaccines. Every person who gets vaccinated is a benefit to society. They become a buffer. They work us toward herd immunity. And we're seeing some of these vaccine sites being underutilized. That is a tragedy right now. We need much better management to help root people to those vaccine sites. Any willing person who's ready to be vaccinated should get that vaccine, become a buffer in society, because inevitably they're then protecting people above certain ages. The yeah. prioritization should remain. People should be given priority, especially on a given day. If they're over a certain age or fit certain medical criteria, absolutely. But we need to unbundle the access to vaccination as fast as we can so that the whole society becomes buffered. Those are some great points. And I think, you know, what's been going on with the vaccine, uh, you know, people still, you can still catch COVID even after you've had the vaccine. So I think it's creating a, a bit of a... Um, there's a there's a bit of a uh, mistrust that's that's sort of forming with the vaccine because people that are still getting it don't understand that you can still get COVID. It just pr protects you and lowers the symptoms, lowers the viral load, and and the chances of you giving it off to someone else. And I you know I recently heard a great um, talk by Yuval Noah Harari where he says the best invention in history, in his opinion, is the invention of the vaccine. Yeah. Undoubtedly, undoubtedly, yeah, one of the, yeah. Sorry, Mick. Because do you know what the vaccine? Could you want to explain what a vaccine actually does? Absolutely. The way that I think of a vaccine is that it's an upgrade for your immune system. Your immune system is something that, when it gets exposed to a pathogen, it takes time to ramp up and react, and it first has to figure out what on earth is going on. <laughs> so there's a time delay in that. And it's always a question of what's going to win the proliferation and acceleration that that virus is undergoing as it's starting to replicate and take over host, it actually host itself inside your cells and your immune system's ability to recognize it and deal with it. There's always this tug of war or this, I suppose, race to try and see what will win out. And sometimes your immune system will even respond inappropriately to these types of situations. So Mick, there is no doubt that one of the best technologies that humans have ever created is vaccines. Vaccines is, I suppose, has created this world that we find ourselves in where we live mostly not worrying so much about viruses pre-COVID. That's because of vaccination. Vaccines upgrade your immune system by giving you exposure and awareness to your immune system early so that it's able to then recognize. And you raise such important points is that if you've had a vaccine, yes, you can still get COVID, but your probability of transmitting it to other people, crucial, crucial, drops dramatically. Your prognosis, your outcome, your medical picture will inevitably look better because your immune system is pre-trained. And of course, the virus is going to mutate. So the sooner we all get vaccinated, the less biological airtime we will give to the virus, the less probability evolutionarily the virus has of mutating because it needs a host to proliferate and to do so. So therefore, while you imagine the immune system having this little race with a virus in your body, you can imagine that same race going on for us as a species. Totally, totally agree. And, I, and also just another point is that when you, the vaccine leaves only the knowledge of how to fight the disease. Right. It does nothing else stays in your body, but the knowledge and the, and the empowerment of how to actually fight the disease or whatever the vaccine is trying to uh, fight against. That's absolutely right. Your immune system goes through a training process. And that's why you might have a, a slight immune flare up. Um, I work somewhat in healthcare and I've seen very transient symptoms of people who have been vaccinated. Very short term symptoms. They come through it very easily and very quickly. And then they are upgraded from then on. This is a great hack. We speak about hacking humans a lot. One of the best hacks that we have is the ability to train and upgrade your own immune system through these vectors, these very clever vaccines. 
And now we have new technology when it comes to vaccination. You've of course heard of this messenger, messenger RNA, different mechanism of vaccinating the same process, effectively exposing the immune system to a benign, non-harmful version. It's not, it's not COVID that gets injected into you, not at all. It's either another, depending on which technology you choose, it's either allowing your cells to express a protein that looks like COVID, so your body learns to recognize it, or it's, or, or it's a benign virus that gets into your cells that is not COVID, another virus. This technology has been around for very, very long, the, the more traditional vaccine technologies. And, uh, you know, it's just, if you have the opportunity to get vaccinated, please do so. Get your first vaccination possible, the first one that becomes accessible to you. Love it. Thank you. I mean, yeah, hack, hack yourself, become a, become a buffer, as you say. Become and, a buffer. Uh, let's get over this thing. Um, Absolutely. We've been talking for hours. We have we've have run out of time. Uh, thanks so much for your time, Adam. Really appreciate it. And we look forward to seeing you at the Singularity U South Africa Summit coming up from the 12th to the 15th of October. We look forward to uh, seeing you soon in person, hopefully. I truly hope so, Mick. It's always such a wonderful pleasure to chat to you. Thank you so much for having me and for spending the time with me and for you know sharing these, these thoughts together. It's, it's been a wonderful chat. And I can't wait for the summit. I can't wait to have that uh, conversation with, with everyone at the summit about the power of investing in oneself, the power that we can, can ultimately create and the, the benefits that it can create for ourselves and, of course, for our species and the world at large. So thank you so much, Mick. Awesome to chat to you. Thanks so much. Thanks, Adam. And I really hope that you all enjoyed that episode. Make sure to like and subscribe on our page. Uh, if you're listening on the podcast, please uh, make sure to give us a, a good review on Apple or Android, whatever store you're listening on. And uh, just stay safe out there. Use Adam's insights. Make sure that you hack yourself for good and uh, keep smiling. Yeah. Cheers. Yeah.